know it's okay to tap your toes if you know you're dancing during that, uh, that lunch. We're glad that you're here this morning. We're glad that folks are watching online via Facebook. Uh, we are a church that tries our best, as I mentioned, to glorify God and to help people to grow to be like Jesus. And one of the ways that we do that here at Mountain View is what we call Discovering Mountain View. It is our four-part growth track. Uh, they come any time over four weeks, and you'll learn how God has designed you, how he's wired you, why you're uniquely you, uh, how you can serve in a meaningful way in the church or in the community, and just learn more about our story, uh, who we are as a church, where we come from, where God's taking us. That's called Discovering Mountain View, and that means every Sunday at 1045, upstairs at the end of the hall. You don't need to register, you just need to show up, and you don't have to go straight through all four. Uh, you can come any time that you would like. We are in this series on the book of Ephesians, and it has been a, a wonderful study so far, walking through this book of the Bible that kind of describes for us how God sees us and how we ought to see God. And so we're going to come to a part of Scripture this morning I really love from the book of Ephesians, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in just a second. Uh, there's a lady by the name of Jennifer Schultz. Uh, she's an author. Uh, she's a blogger. She's written a couple of books. And in one of her articles, she talks about taking her children when they were smaller on vacation. And they went to a city uh, where there was the local aquarium. Maybe you've been to one of these. Uh, and it looks a little bit like this. Uh, we live in the Bay Area. Uh, we didn't live too far from the Monterey Aquarium, and so it's kind of fun to go to. And they have these tanks where you have all kinds of sea animals and creatures, you know, that are there in the tank. And, and you can look at them and in some cases reach down and, and pet the animals or the fish. And this particular one had little baby sharks that were floating in the tank. And so being a good mother of small children, you know, who are sticking their hand down, down in the water, she asked the attendant who was nearby, do the sharks ever snap at the feet? And the attendant said, no, you know, we feed them really well. And then before they come out, we feed them even more. So, you know, so they're not hungry and they won't snap at anything. And so then she said to the attendant, but if they're hungry, and the attendant said, yeah, that's not too good. You know, if you stick your hand down in there, it's like little floating sausages. Up on top of the water, and the sharks tend to snap at, at those. And so Jennifer said that, that kind of that moment, a passage of Scripture came to her out of the Old Testament book of Proverbs. And the proverb is Proverbs chapter 27. And it reads like this. One who is full, in other words, who is not hungry, who is satisfied. The one who is full loathes honey from the comb, but to the person who's hungry, everything looks good. You know, in other words, what is bitter taste sweet? That's true physically, isn't it? You know, if you're really hungry, I, I don't mean, you know, just a little hungry, I mean, but you're really hungry, you'll eat just about anything. You know, you'll eat a box of donuts, you'll eat a box of good donuts, come in, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll eat just about anything if you're really hungry. Here's the thing I want you to notice. The same is true with spiritual hunger. That when someone has a spiritual hunger, a void, you know, a kind of sense that, that life is empty and there's more out there, but I don't know what it is. I don't know where to find it. That when we're spiritually hungry, we'll eat almost anything. We live in a culture uh, where more and more people will describe themselves as spiritual. But if you ask them to define that, you know, nail that to the wall. It's kind of like nailing jello to the wall. You, you can't really nail a definition that sticks because nobody really can put their finger on what they mean by that. And here's what people do when they're spiritually hungry. They oftentimes go to find a momentary fix. Well, what's going to fill me up until the next time to eat? You know, until the next time, you know, that, that I'm hungry. And many of these momentary fixes that people find to feel better about themselves, they have a sense of value. That they have a sense that they matter. A lot of these solutions are external. So they dress different. They dress better. You know, it, it, it's this external sense of, of who I am. And they try to fill this spiritual void from the outside in. What we're going to find in today's passage is that's backwards thinking. That the way God sees it, that it is that true sense of value and worth that comes from the inside out. In fact, let me frame our conversation for us this way. And here's the one main idea, the big idea. You can write this down, take a picture, however you like, like to do this. And that is, if you are a Christian, and you've done this transaction with God, and this transformation has begun, 
that when Jesus dwells in your heart through faith, you no longer need these external sources of validation. You no longer need them. In other words, these momentary things that we try, these external sources of validation, we no longer need these. Because what we find is that having Christ in our heart, where Jesus is in our life, that's all the validation that we need. The passage that we've been looking at, the book we've been working our way through since the first of September, is the New Testament book of Ephesians. Uh, it's a wonderful book. It's only six chapters, so it's not real long. Uh, it, it's maybe not as deep uh, as some other books of the Bible, for example, Romans. And it is a book where Paul, the writer who writes the book of Ephesians, will talk about how do you see yourself? How do you see God? How does God see you? And how are those different? Because oftentimes how we see ourselves is different than how God sees. How we see God isn't always the way God is. And so Paul writes this book that really challenges and transforms our thinking about God. And we find that in this particular passage this morning. It's found in Ephesians chapter 3. We're going to start verse 14. I'm going to work our way down through about a paragraph or so. Make a few comments. Draw a few conclusions and we'll call it good. So Ephesians chapter 3 verse 14. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14. Paul says, For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. So, so notice, first of all, the language, the posture. Uh, Paul, as he does often throughout the book of Ephesians, will stop and say, I'm praying for you. And then he goes right into what he's praying for. The language Paul is using here is the posture of prayer. He says, for this reason, I am kneeling before God. And, and then he makes a statement about God that's incredible. He says, this God that I'm kneeling before is, is no lowercase g God, you know, no junior varsity kind, kind of God. You know, he's the God from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. What's he talking about? Is, is he talking about it in a very literal sense that, that the reason, you know, you have a name on your birth certificate, you know, the reason you call Bill or Bob or, or, or whatever that is, is because God got that specific? Is he talking about your name, your nickname, what's on your driver's license? Or is he talking about something that's even more fundamental? I believe what he's talking about is our sense of identity. In other words, whether you believe in God or not, whether you've recognized God or not, acknowledged God or not, that, that if we believe God is the source of all things and all people are, are created in the image of God, then our identity, our true identity, comes from God. Here's what's going to happen, however. The culture that we live in is constantly trying to define us. It's trying to tell you who you really are, or, or even, even worse, maybe who you ought to be. You know, maybe who you ought to be when you grow up, you know, who you ought to be when you retire. That, that our culture is constantly trying to define us. As the, the father of two still relatively young daughters at 19 and 22, I can tell you that was something I was constantly aware of during their teenage years. That we live in a culture that says to be acceptable, to be loved, to be valued, you have to look a certain way. And I felt my, my role as a father was to help them understand their true identity. We live in a culture where oftentimes, particularly for men, our career defines us. And so we meet someone new, you know, we're doing those chit-chat introductions, and what often comes up? Well, what do you do for a living? I had a wonderful opportunity just last Sunday. Uh, last Sunday evening, about 4.30, I was invited to speak at a national conference downtown at the Hyatt. And as best I could tell in this crowd of 500 people, I might have been one of a handful of professing Christians. And I knew right up front that they knew I was a pastor, said so in the program, they mentioned it in my introduction, and I felt right up front, I've got to hit that head on. Because I understand, you know, how they probably perceive me even before I speak. Because they have this idea, this conception. Oftentimes a misconception. And so one of the things I said is, I don't normally introduce myself to somebody new right up front as a pastor. 
And the reason for that is being a pastor, that's what I do. But it's not who I am. That doesn't define me. Sometimes we let, if we're to be honest, we, we let our failures and our mistakes define us. Maybe you, you know someone, maybe it's a family member or friend, and, and it doesn't take too long in the conversation. But before, you know, the mistake comes up, or their past comes up, or, or because why they can't do or why they shouldn't do because of something in their, their past. What Paul is saying at a very basic level is our identity, our true identity, comes from God. Every family, heaven on earth, derives its name from God, its value, its identity. And then notice where Paul goes next, verse 16. Paul says, I pray that out of his, talking about God, his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his, his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Paul, in, in just these couple of verses, uh, does a wonderful theological trick here. He does, a, he does a wonderful thing of weaving all three parts, all three persons of the Godhead in the two verses. He talks about God, his glorious riches. He talks about the Spirit's role in strengthening us in our inner being so that Christ may be dwelling in our hearts. But one of the things that makes our Christian faith unique is our belief in the Trinity, the Triune God. This idea that God is in three persons, God the Father, God, God the Son, God the Spirit. And that they are three in one, distinct but unique in how they function. And Paul says that God has these glorious riches. And what he's trying to do is to get his spirit to have more access in your life. So that he can strengthen you where? In your inner being. Not slap the lipstick on a pig. Not, not, not the outside, you know, trying to work in. But the spirit's role is to strengthen us on the inside. So that Christ may dwell, may dwell where? In our hearts. But when I was growing up, we didn't talk a, a lot about the Holy Spirit. We didn't believe it. You know, we, 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 we knew that much, but we didn't really quite know what he did or how he did it. You know, it was kind of foggy a little bit. And so sometimes we struggle to understand, how, how does the Spirit do this? You know, if he's to strengthen us in our inner being, how, how's that happen? What's that look like? My wife uh, has loved live musicals since she was a little kid. Uh, her father, mother, and dad loved live musicals, stage musicals. And so when we got married, it was kind of a package deal. You know, I, I had to go along, and, and I had to either learn to love them or at least stay away. That, that was one of my goals right there. Uh, and so I've learned to love, actually, live musicals. And our favorite uh, has been for a number of years, I think we've seen it four different places, uh, is Les Miserables. And here's a picture of, of Les Miserables being one of the productions of that. Uh, if you're American, you can pronounce it Les Miserables, okay? So, so if you're American, that's just how you say it, Les, Les Miserables. Yeah, I'm not going to tell you a storyline of, of Les Mis. It's really not, you know, the point. But if you've ever been to a live production downtown at Denver Performing Arts Center or high school production, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. If it's a live production and, and, and you've got actors and actresses on stage, maybe singers, you've got the stage, you've got props, what you often don't see, matter of fact, you shouldn't see, is what's happening backstage. You have your tech crew. You have your stage hands. These are the people who turn the set around, you know, who come out, take the props on, put the new ones on. You know, they can do all of that. And many times they are dressed in black from head to toe because they don't want to stand out. That's not their role. It's not their function. In fact, their job, their function is to fire the lights at the right time, make sure the actors have the right things in the right costume so that what's on stage shines. So that your attention and your focus is what's happening on the stage. And if you start to notice the stage hands, then they're not doing their job because they're distracting you from what ought to be happening on the stage. In many ways, that's the role of the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit works behind the scenes. He, he works through scripture. He works through, through guidance, through whispers, through counsel, through groups. And his job is not to draw attention to himself. His job is to make Jesus the center stage so that Jesus shines and all eyes are on Jesus. And as Paul says, 
so that you might be strengthened in your inner being. Not weak, not lazy, not flabby. Strengthened so that Christ may dwell in your heart. That word dwell is a fantastic word. When, if I were to, to ask you, so, where do you live? Uh, you would give me directions. Maybe you'd give me an actual address. And if you were kind of telling me how to get there, uh, you, you might say, well, our house is the third house down from the floor. Or, you know, our home, you know, my, my, our home is here. It, you know, we named our house blue. We use that language, house, home. Uh, very few of you, probably none of you, uh, if you were to invite us over this week for dinner, say, we'd love to have you come over to our dwelling for, for dinner. You know, th th this week, can you come over to our dwelling? You know, our dwelling is that third dwelling down from the corner. We don't use that language. That's just, that's kind of like weird. Kind of like but Paul uses the word dwelling on purpose. Because how many different homes have you lived in? Houses. I'm that probably unusual person that when I was born, you know, I came home from the hospital. I came home to the very same house that I lived in until I left for college. That's unusual. And since then, we've moved to different cities, even within certain cities, moved to different houses. But we've had many different houses, many different homes. A dwelling, as Paul talks about. What's kind of built into this word is permanence. In other words, it's not Jesus coming for a three-day visit. You know, it, it's not Jesus signing a 12-month lease, you know, and, and then when the lease comes up, he decides whether or not to, re, you know, renegotiate, you know, renew, that, that when he makes his dwelling in your heart, that word has built into it permanence. He's a permanent resident. Whether you like it or not, he's not going anywhere. He's going to stay put. But he's dwelling in your heart. And so Paul here is talking about this kind of inner battle, this kind of inner strength. And he's saying that Jesus, what he wants to do is to dwell in your heart. But when he moves in, what does he find? When you invite him in, you open up, you say yes, surrender, however, whatever language you want to use. And Jesus moves in. What does he find? Honestly, he finds a house that looks a little bit like this. Maybe worse. It's trash. You know, there, there, there's this trash everywhere. All the furniture's upended. You know, when he moves in, it looks like a bobcat's been let loose in the living room. You know, everything is just upside down, turned over trash. And yet when Jesus moves in, what does he begin to do if we allow him? If we allow the Holy Spirit to operate, give him freedom, to start doing the work in our heart, in our inner being, he begins the process of what the Bible calls sanctification. Think of it as remodel. He comes in, he says, okay, we got to clean this up. You know, we, we can't have this. This is out of style. This, this doesn't fit anymore. You know, we need to knock this wall out. We need some more room. And so he moves into your heart. He, he makes it his dwelling. And because he's not going anywhere, he wants to shape it the way that he wants it to be. So he begins that work. And what he starts to do within us is he's trying to create within us an awareness, a recognition, an appreciation, a passion for what is most important to God. Because when, when we kind of were the only people living in the house, you know, we had whatever we wanted. You know, we did whatever we wanted, whatever we wanted. You know, that was kind of it was our place. And when Jesus moves in, he says, no, no, no. There's something that's more important. And he tells us, Paul does, what that is in the next verse. Notice the last part of verse 17. Paul says, And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power. That word literally uh, is the same word that we get the word dynamite from. So he's not talking about, you know, a small jolt. You know, he's talking about explosive power. So he says, I pray that you may have power. Together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. What's most important to God? 
when Jesus becomes becomes your roommate, when he moves in and he starts to take over, what does he want us to know? He wants us to know first the love of God. God loves you. So I'm praying that, 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 that you, will, you will be rooted in this love, that you'll know this love, that you'll grasp this love, that you'll know beyond the shadow of a doubt that God loves you. Second thing that's important to God is that we're loving towards others. Because we're grasping this love together with all of God's holy people. It's not just me individual by myself. But he wants you to know that he loves you and that he wants you to love other people. Paul uses language here that paints a really good picture. So, so he talks about being rooted, established. That, that whole idea of rooted, I think most of us probably get, right? Because you know, we're familiar with plants and trees. You know, this whole idea that they have roots, they go down into the soil, they draw their nutrients and what they need to live, and so we're going to have that image of, of roots. When we lived in Northern California, uh, we lived on the East Bay side of things over in Walnut Creek, but we didn't live too far from the redwood trees and the sequoias. And so one of our favorite things to do would be to head north of Marin County, uh, kind of north of the Golden Gate, go up into some of the parks, and, and in some of the, the redwood forests, some of the sequoia trees. And they are just incredible. In fact, I, I work at camp every year now for about 22, 23 years. Uh, that, that's in the midst of, of some redwood. And one of my favorite things to do, it sounds like a little kid, it pro probably is. Uh, I love to just go on a kind of an afternoon and just lay on the ground and just look up. And, and it's like the, these you know, tree skyscrapers are just shooting out. It's just incredible. Sequoia trees can grow as high as 300 feet. Now that's impressive. Their diameter can sometimes be as much as 20 feet. So you probably have seen pictures of, of a redwood sequoia tree that falls over the road. They can't move it, so what they do, they just carve a hole and you can drive a truck through. That's true. It's that big. Some of these trees, when, when you go visit the different redwood sequoias, they might be 1,000 years old, maybe 2,000 or 3,000. Years old. But here's what I find fascinating. You look at one of these sequoia trees that's 300 feet tall, 20 feet, you know, diameter. You probably are thinking, and I'm not a botanist, maybe one of, maybe one of you are, I don't, I don't know. But, but here's how I'm thinking. Okay, 300 foot tree. How deep down do those roots go? You know, is it 50 feet? Is it 100 feet? You know, I'm thinking there's some kind of inverted relationship. Doesn't that seem to make sense? Bigger the tree, deeper the roots. Here's what's incredible about the sequoia tree. They can grow that tall in as little as three feet of soil. Imagine. How could they withstand a light breeze? <laughs> you know, that, that's what I'm thinking. You know, some little kid that just leans on them, you know, doesn't knock them over. Because when their roots go down, they spread horizontally. And if you've ever noticed, most redwood sequoias, they don't grow by themselves. They grow in clusters. They grow around other redwoods and sequoias. And, and, and so their roots go down, and then they go out. And what happens when they go out, they begin to overlap, intersect with other trees. And so instead of withstanding the wind, the storm, the pressure just by themselves, they draw strength from the other trees. Let me go back and put back on the screen what Paul said about being rooted and established. And here's what he said, I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power, that's that dynamite power, explosive power, where? Together. Don't miss it. He says that you experience this rootedness, this power of God in community with other believers. Together with all the Lord's holy people. Now some of you are thinking that, that disqualifies me. You know, where do I find that holy person? You know, when you read the book of Ephesians, here's what you find. When Paul uses that word, he does quite often. He's referring to the average Christian. And there's really no above average Christian. 
that he's referring to all Christians. So when he says, together with all the Lord's holy people, he doesn't mean that you've got to go find you know, that, that superstar. He's talking about all believers. And that we experience this rootedness when we are together. That I draw strength, I have a, a greater ability to withstand pressure. When I am active and consistent in a small group of believers, maybe you have people that you meet to pray with. Maybe it's a, it's a men's Bible study, a women's Bible study. Maybe it's a group at work that you know are believers, and maybe you meet for lunch. But when I am together with other believers, I draw strength from that. Uh, I, I survived my, my high school years. Not because I had a, a really large youth group, I did in fact, I was the only one from our church that attended our high school that had about 3,500, almost 4,000 people. I found believers from other churches, and, and we would eat lunch together and do things together, and we drew strength from each other. Don't miss Paul's point. If you are trying to, to live you know, this life of Jesus, kind of live you know, the life and the values of Jesus, and you're trying to do it in isolation, Paul would not even say good luck. I don't mean Paul would believe in love, first of all. I, I think what he would say is, no, that's dangerous. Because when you're in isolation, you're alone. You're exposed. You're weaker by yourself than you are with others together. So Paul wants us to have a sense of rootedness. But why else do we experience life together? Paul says, I want you to be rooted and established so that you'll have an understanding of the power of God. This power that Paul says the Holy Spirit is using in your inner being, this power to understand the love of God, that when we're together, my awareness of God begins to. I love this, uh, this next story. I heard it years ago. Uh, it just kind of reminds me, kind of like, you know, you see these magazine covers over the years, they make claims, and then 50 years later, they look silly, you know, that kind of thing. So in 1889, uh, this fellow right here was the president of the United States of America. His name's President William McKinley. You know, a little bit better looking than Grover Cleveland, but, you know, still probably not quite ready for social media. You know, probably glad he lived in 19, 1880. You know, so here's you know, William McKinley. He's president of the United States of America. You know, he has his cabinet. He's got all of his federal appointees. And one of those people that reports to him is the director of the United States Patent Office. We still have a patent office. If, if you're an inventor, somebody likes to tinker, kind of come up with ideas, map things out on paper, you know, you maybe you submit it to the patent office. Patent office takes it kind of scrubs it against other ideas, make sure you're not stealing from somebody, and then maybe you get issued a patent, saying you got original work, kind of you know, original ideas. In 1889, William McKinley is meeting with his senior leaders, one of those being the director of the United States Patent Office, and here's what he said. We ought to close down the office. Because everything that can be invented has already been invented. <laughs> that was in 1889. I'm thinking somebody like Nicholas Tesla might disagree, okay? You know, maybe Madame Curry maybe disagrees. Les Paul invented the electric guitar, Steve Wozniak the computer. I I I'm thinking these folks probably would disagree. But everything that can be invented has been invented. Do you know who else would disagree? The Apostle Paul. There are two verses, I believe, uh, for people who have read the book of Ephesians that probably are the most, most recognizable, most famous. The first is what we found in Ephesians chapter 2. That we're saved by grace through faith. It's not something we do. It's not our work. It's a gift of God. And then there's Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. And Paul writes these words, kind of capping off this paragraph. He says, Now to God, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. Let's just stop right there. We raised two kids, you know, from, from birth up, even before they could form complete sentences. 
I mean, just string together a thought, you know, a couple of words. They're asking for something, okay? You know, they're, they're, they're asking for something on the table. They're at, you know, and let me just tell you, if you have small children, that doesn't change. Okay, so they're going to continue to ask as, as long as they as long as they can. They can ask for about anything. We can ask for about anything. What about your imagination? If you're allowed to run wild, kind of just turn it loose. Not worry about staying within the lines, but just kind of kind of, kind of just turn it on. You can imagine a lot of things. And Paul says that God is not able to do just a step beyond that. He's able to do immeasurably more. And what we ask for a minute, how? According to his power. That's that same word we found earlier. It's the same word that means dynamite, explosive. That according to his power, that is at work where? Not around us. Not outside of us. Not external, trying to force change from the outside in. His power that is at work within. That's some serious boldness. That right now that it is running through each and every one of us who have identified with Christ. That power is at work within us. Verse 21, why does he do all this? To him be glory in the church. And in Christ Jesus, through all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Paul says, when you begin to understand the rootedness, the love of God, that, that God wants Jesus to live in your heart, your view of God begins to expand. Can't help it. This love that, that passes knowledge, this love that, that is so wide, deep, high, you can't get your arm around it, that, that your view of God begins to grow. It doesn't shrink. If your view of God has gotten smaller over the years, then something's bad. Because if you're getting to know God, and, and, and you're growing in this sense of His grace and His love, then, then your view ought to be expanded. Paul says that, that when you begin to understand the same love of God and, and that what Jesus wants to do inside of you, that, that your purpose for living changes, that, that you now have this reason to live, to bring glory to God. doesn't mean you have to go off and, and join the monastery, become a priest, become a nun. It, it just means you've got to be faithful to who God's made you to be, where you are. But you live to bring glory to God. Where, Paul says, the church, through the body of Christ, through the kingdom of God. So let me close where we started this morning, with this reminder, that when Christ dwells in your heart through faith, you don't need to go pursue some external source of validation. You don't have to chase the wind. You don't have to jump from moment to moment, you know, from whatever to whatever, trying to find something that's going to make you momentarily feel better. Because what God has already done is more than enough. We say this around a lot here on Avenue, that we don't want things from you, that we want things for you. And what, what I want for you, if you are a Christian, if you're in Christ, is to know that you are already enough. That God doesn't love you any more or less right now than he ever will. And that the only validation that you need, the only sense of worth, the only sense of value, God has already given you. Anything else that you find, anything else that you pursue, is temporary at the best, dangerous at the best. That when Christ is in your heart through faith, it's freedom. It's freedom. I, I don't have to get anxious and stressed out and chase after things I can never catch. Because God has already caught me. And that's enough.